Yeah, it's my pleasure to uh, give the last talk uh, in the microkernel dev room this year. And we will talk about uh, Meltra and Specdown. So this is actually a deliberate misspelling because in early 2018, when we had a conference call with a customer, the sentence came up, okay, and we need to talk about Meltra and Specdown. And at that point, uh, nobody really noticed uh, this uh, funny misspelling or uh, pronunciation here. So that sticked uh, with us when we uh, talk about these uh, yeah, vulnerabilities. Um, and the idea, um, or a better title for this talk, um, then uh, maybe should be um, the impact of meltdown and spectral vulnerabilities on the L4RE microkernel system, because everything I will show you here today is um, related to L4RE and uh, Fiasco, obviously, so it's more anecdotic uh, evidence instead of having a broad view on every or multiple different microkernel systems and how they deal with these kind of vulnerabilities. Um, so when I prepared this talk, um, I basically started uh, with a couple of questions um, I wanted to answer. And the first one is, uh, were we somehow prepared for these kind of vulnerabilities? So how hard did they hit us uh, uh, at the end? And uh, maybe some of the microkernel design principles that they help us or protect us from some of the vulnerabilities. Um, and at the end, of course, we had to implement mitigations. Uh, so what's the impact, uh, basically the performance impact of these mitigations? Um, to give you a quick spoiler, um, no, we weren't prepared in any way. Um, uh, yeah, the time was ripe uh, for these kind of vulnerabilities to be discovered, um, as we have seen throughout the last year. Um, but yeah, we were not prepared. Um, yeah, the design principles uh, principles helped us a little bit, and yeah, the mitigations or the implemented mitigations we will see later. So let me first uh, introduce you uh, quickly back uh, what Meltdown and Spectra is. Um, so basically it's a set of uh, vulnerabilities in modern CPUs related to out of order and speculative execution. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah, these um, mechanisms uh, are implemented in modern CPUs um, to yeah, increase utilization of the computation units uh, inside the CPU and to basically the, gain performance advantages. Um, and uh, nothing on the architectural um, um, side was wrong in these CPUs, but unfortunately these um, an out of order or pre, uh, speculative execution caused observable side effects, and these were the actual vulnerabilities. Um, so we had to implement uh, mitigations. And I want to start um, with Meltdown, welcome. And um, if we look at the um, classic virtual address space layout, and I picked the 32-bit layout here um, as just an example. Uh, so um, the actual layout may be different, but that's sort of the classical layout where you have a virtual address space uh, for the user uh, ranging from 0 to 3 gigabytes. And in the upper gigabyte, usually um, the kernel is um, visible in the address space. And, um, of course, um, the kernel memory is protected by setting a supervisor bit or some extra bit in the page table entries so that the user cannot directly access um, the kernel memory. But the advantage is if you're context switching uh, into the kernel for a system call or something else, uh, you basically uh, don't need to switch address spaces or context. Um, if you look a little bit further, uh, we see that usually uh, a lot of kernels also uh, completely map in the physical memory of the system. For example, for DMA or something like that. So that's, for example, the case uh, in Linux. And um, the vulnerability of Meltdown basically was um, that a user uh, could um, start a short execution sequence, uh, which uh, the CPU um, without checking the correct uh, access privileges uh, caused uh, to read in memory that actually was um, yeah, protected by the kernel. Um, and then this content of this memory ended up uh, being in the level one or second level cache. 
and then using a uh, side channel analysis, um, the user could infer the data uh, which was uh, under the protection of the kernel. And the unfortunate thing was uh, that this was possible on a, or is possible on a very high bandwidth um, in, yeah, where we speak about megabytes per second, so up to 500 megabytes per second. Um, so um, if we look at Alpha Rio, especially Fiasco, um, um, Fiasco only reserves a fixed amount uh, of the physical memory for itself, so for storing um, kernel data structures like page tables and something, uh, the mapping database. Um, so it reserves um, a certain percentage of the whole amount of memory um, and maps this, of course, into the kernel. Um, so the first observation here is that not all physical memory is mapped into the kernel. But uh, in order to save on uh, page tables and also TLB entries, uh, the kernel tries to use as huge pages as it can get on the particular architecture. Um, so for example, on x86, where it is uh, available, it tries to use one gigabyte pages. So there may be an overlap between the memory the kernel is actually using and uh, some physical memory that is uh, usually used by the user. Um, so this mapping may include some uh, physical memory that is used by a user process. And then uh, we ran um, yeah, this example, uh, meltdown example, and we were also able um, to observe uh, some of the data that was uh, mapped by the kernel or by this big uh, mapping. <clears throat> so it was clear, uh, so yeah, basically the, this picture, so there's also memory mapped into the kernel. Uh, but not the complete physical memory. Um, so it was clear we had to implement um, a mitigation and the obvious mitigation is here to implement a separate address space for the kernel. Uh, in the Linux community, it's the kernel page table isolation, so we call it also a page table isolation PTI. And basically we move the kernel into its own address space and we also decided to put um, uh, the kernel into its local address space on each CPU. So each CPU now um, has its own kernel uh, local address space. And of course, uh, we need to map um, some parts of the kernel into the user um, so that um, the user process uh, has the chance to enter and exit the kernel. So we need some basic uh, data structures like the GDT, uh, TSS, and entry and exit stacks. And of course, the UTCBs must be visible um, there. Okay, so what's the impact of um, these measures? So because now for every kernel entry and exit, uh, we have basically two context switches where previously there was none. Um, so before I show you the number uh, numbers, um, I want to share some of the meter information. Um, so um, as the baseline uh, for all these benchmarks I did, I took um, the fiasco uh, from January 1st, 2018, so from last year, before we started implementing all of these countermeasures. And I compared it uh, to the version of January 7th uh, from this year. Um, you can go check out um, these commits on our GitHub if you're interested and uh, yeah, verify or confirm these measurements. I used um, Clang 6 to compile the kernel the user land was compiled with the GCC 7.3. And for uh, a platform I used in Core i7 machine, uh, it's a quad-core machine with hyper-threading uh, running usually at 2.6 gigahertz. And if you're interested, um, I can send you the raw data I uh, gathered. So there are more numbers um, than I just present here. So if you're interested, I can share that with you. So um, I then ran a couple of micro benchmarks um, to yeah, uh, quantify the overhead incurred there. Um, but yeah, micro benchmarks are not really uh, modeling real world workloads uh, very well. So I also measured two scenarios. And the first one is that I ran two Alpha Linux instances uh, on this machine. Um, each one gets uh, two CPUs assigned exclusively, so they're running on different CPUs. And I have two fiber network cards uh, via PCI in this machine, which uh, were 
I, one is um, each assigned to one of the um, Alpha Linux instances. Then I connected them directly using uh, fiber optics and I measured the throughput between those two VMs. <clears throat> and uh, to yeah, create a sort of more worst case scenario, um, I set up um, these two Alpha Linux VMs uh, now with one CPU, uh, one virtual CPU each, uh, put them on the same CPU and connected them using a virtual uh, network link uh, using virtio net. Um, so this component uh, was already presented by Jakub earlier this day. Um, so they are connected with a virtual network connection also running on the same CPU so that uh, when we are running this benchmarks, we have a lot of context switches, virtual interrupts going on there on this one CPU. So we should see a real yeah, stress uh, or this overhead when there is real stress on, on one CPU. Okay, so um, to the micro benchmarks first. Um, so I used this ping pong utility, which has been there on um, L4 systems for ages, uh, I would say. And I picked uh, three particular micro benchmarks there. So first, sending an IPC message between uh, two different uh, threads running in different, uh, in different tasks um, so that there is a context switch involved. Um, we measured also the context or the context switch itself and the switch of a thread within uh, the same context or address space. And here you can see, or we can see, that um, IPC performance uh, yeah, dropped quite dramatically. Um, so it's only, uh, or dropped by 54%, uh, basically. So that's more than uh, double the amount uh, or before um, this uh, page table isolation. Also the uh, context switch um, suffered 30% and thread switching is uh, 57%. So that's quite a huge overhead. Um, so how does that um, end up in some more uh, real world uh, workloads? And there we can see, so I measured, using, uh, measured the network throughput using iPerf um, and the baseline performance here was uh, not exactly 10 gigabytes per second, but 9.37. And um, with using kernel page table isolation, it slightly dropped, uh, but it's within 1%. So I would consider this more of a measuring error or within the usual um, um, yeah, limits of um, these cards. So it's not uh, quite dramatic right now. <clears throat> The picture looks a little bit different when we have this worst case scenario running everything on one CPU. Um, so the baseline performance is around five gigabytes, uh, gigabits per second and now dropping down to 3.17 gigabyte, uh, gigabits per second, which is a 1.6 increase um, in the yeah, time it needs to uh, transfer this data. So that's quite, quite heavy. All right, um, moving on uh, to, to Spectra, um, the next guy in the house here. And um, yeah, just a brief and very, very um, j uh, yeah, high level um, description of what Spectra is. Um, so Spectra vulnerabilities are usually um, 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 or are um, defined by having an indirect branch prediction, uh, which then speculatively accesses data it shouldn't uh, access, and these data excesses cause side effects that again can be um, observed uh, using side uh, channel analysis. And one of these indirect um, branch uh, predictions is, for example, this piece of code uh, where you have an index which is checked against an upper limit of an array. And if uh, that um, index is within the, this limit, it is used uh, to gather a uh, value from an array, which again then the value is used uh, to access data in, within an, an, another array. And um, if this is mispredicted, uh, or if this is yeah, mispredicted, so actually the actual index is larger than this um, array size, but the uh, CPU um, executes this pa code path speculatively, the value uh, from array two may end up in the caches, uh, which then can be observed. <clears throat> 
All right. Um, for dramatic reason, I now drop out of the yeah more um, um, uh, causal um, order of things uh, and first want to talk about Spectra NG, uh, which was um, um, discovered by Julian um, as, uh, together with a colleague. Um, so um, they made the discovery that uh, the CPU also um, speculatively accesses FPU state while um, the current thread or the current context running on the CPU is not the owner of the FPU. Um, so that's bad because Fiasco uses lazy FPU switching, which means that only uh, threads um, that need access to the FPU uh, will get or become the owner of the FPU by the first access uh, causing a trap, which is then uh, used to restore the original FPU state for that thread, and then the thread can continue. And this is a sort of yeah, performance optimization because uh, at least in earlier times, um, not all threads uh, needed the FPU, so the expensive FPU switching uh, was avoided. Um, yeah, the obvious mitigation is, of course, uh, implement eager FPU switching on x86. Um, and the question is, does that incur any performance loss? So um, we benchmarked that. And um, now we can see that we add another overhead in the micro benchmarks here. Um, so you can see that it is um, basically yeah, 300 to 350 cycles um, extra, which is um, the amount uh, of cycles you need to save the whole FPU state on this particular CPU. <clears throat> um, Switch, uh, going back, uh, going into more yeah, real-world workloads, uh, we can see uh, that now uh, we are getting yeah, some uh, measurable uh, performance loss here. Um, so let me have a look into my uh, sheet. Yeah, it's another roughly, it's between 10 to 15 percent um, for uh, these uh, real-world uh, workloads here. And Oh, no, sorry, I was... Uh, uh, in the wrong line here. So it's uh, actually 4% uh, between the PTI and the PTI plus eager FPU uh, mitigations. So and now we're getting uh, where it is um, yeah, some high performance uh, applications it might already start to hurt. Um, and the same picture is uh, for this worst case scenario. Um, it is also um, dropping uh, a little bit. Um, as you may know or remember, um, there is a lot of more, a lot more to yeah, spectral vulnerabilities. So there's a very long list already, um, and we analyzed um, all of them and found that most variants uh, do not work across process boundaries. Um, so they not directly pose a threat um, to our system. So these um, um, applications then have to implement countermeasures by themselves. And we also uh, found that usually uh, you require code execution to somehow train the predictor in the CPU so that it actually starts mispredicting um, then uh, uh, your code so that you can actually um, start your attack um, on, the, on the CPUs. So, um, but anyways, uh, we had to, or we implemented um, the mitigations provided uh, by a microcode update uh, from Intel. So they introduced new instructions um, to prevent indirect branch prediction. Uh, so basically putting in barriers. Um, so we implemented that um, indirect branch prediction barrier when you enter the kernel. And at a context switch, uh, we implemented a full prediction barrier. Um, for that, uh, we also had to implement microkernel function uh, loading, uh, microcode loading functionality in the kernel, um, because at that time not all BIOSes uh, provided these um, microcode uh, micro updates. Sorry for confusing this again. And um, some of these uh, BIOSes um, also are not updated ad until today, so it was a good decision to actually uh, put that into the kernel as well. Um, so we benchmarked uh, that as well, and yeah, the results are not good. Uh, so you can see uh, that 
now the bar is even higher. Um, so instead of uh, initially having an IPC round trip of uh, roughly 1,500 cycles, uh, we are now at 16,600 cycles, which is more than a tenfold increase in IPC round trip time. And uh, so what you can expect from these numbers is that it now also dramatically hurts uh, real world uh, workloads. Yeah, and you can see that here. Um, so for the um, yeah, um, scenario one, uh, we have a 20% uh, loss in performance. So just raw throughput of packets between two virtual machines not doing something else. And uh, the picture is even darker. Uh, looking at this worst case scenario, um, there we have a 75% loss. So we are ending up with a quarter of the performance we had initially. And that's quite, um, yeah, bad. Um, before coming to my conclusion, um, I wanted to share uh, some information on the foreshadow attack uh, with you as well. Um, this one was also uh, known as the L1 terminal fault. Um, so basically, uh, the CPU used uh, speculatively uh, entry, invalid entries from the page tables um, to yeah, speculatively access data. Um, and <clears throat> um, this is bad because, um, for example, Linux uses invalid page table entries to store, for example, um, information about page out uh, memory pages um, by invalidating the entry and then putting in some meta information uh, into this entry um, and the data in this entry then was used to access um, some memory. And Intel um, acknowledged um, that this um, it, um, problem or this bug um, affected um, the operating system and also as a system management mode, also uh, the virtualization extension and also SGX. So um, SGX is not supported in L4E, so we didn't care. Um, so that was good for us. And we also decided that the system management mode has to protect itself. Um, so by, for example, flushing the L1 data cache uh, when returning uh, back into the normal mode. Um, but we had to do something about um, the operating system and or analyze the uh, uh, impacts on the operating system and the virtualization. So in the operating system, we were lucky. Uh, we are not, uh, or we were not vulnerable, because uh, when we invalidate a page table entry, um, we also zero out the page table entry. So there is no uh, address or any data in it uh, which the CPU can use uh, to do some speculation. But VTX, uh, especially nested paging, uh, is nasty, because uh, the problem here is that the CPU, um, so um, the guest can now uh, provide an invalid uh, page table entry in its um, own page table. And um, the CPU then starts translating that uh, in hardware, um, but it's not uh, translating it down to host physical addresses, but instead uses the translated guest physical address to speculatively um, continue execution uh, instead of giving a fault. Um, which then later, of course, occurs, but at that point we have lost because there are already um, observable side effects. Um, so uh, what we have to do here is uh, we have to implement or load another microcode update uh, into the CPU, which uh, provides new uh, MSRs uh, where we can uh, read out, uh, it's called CPU capabilities. Um, and there is now a new instruction for flushing the L1 data cache. Uh, which uh, we then uh, have to do on every VM resume. So every time the kernel uh, resumes a virtual machine, uh, we have to flush the L1 data cache. Yeah, sorry, no benchmarks uh, for that one. Uh, I didn't uh, make it uh, for FOSTEM uh, to provide uh, or to measure some, some numbers here. So time for the conclusion, uh, but there's one more thing uh, before I want to do that. And um, as you may have guessed it already, um, we implemented all of these features as configurable options uh, in Fiasco. So you can still uh, go back to sort of the original state uh, we had in 
beginning of uh, 2018. So we can turn off kernel page table isolation, we can turn off eager FPU switching going back to the lazy scheme, and we can also uh, remove the support for these branch prediction barriers. And um, so the interesting question for me at that point was, um, so how do we compare one year later uh, to the 2018 uh, baseline performance? Uh, so that's the full picture. So um, let me put that uh, or move that a little bit around. Um, so now the blue and the green bar are basically the interesting ones. <clears throat> and there you can see that we slightly improve performance uh, on the micro benchmarks here. Um, so I will uh, tell you in the conclusions uh, why or what I suspect uh, the reason is this. Um, so as you may now also n um, guess, um, if you compare the numbers, uh, we don't expect much of an influence in the real-world benchmarks or in the where we put on real load onto the machines. And here you can see that basically the baseline performance is unchanged. So already again uh, within this uh, one percent uh, per um, yeah window, and also for the worst case scenario, we basically get the same performance. So at, if at some point in time we get um, fixed CPUs, um, then we can go back and basically have the same performance as before. Okay, conclusion uh, to finish the talk. Um, well, Fiasco is still not the fastest microkernel in the world, uh, and probably it will never be, uh, but um, we saw um, that we lost quite a lot of performance due to these implemented uh, mitigations. Um, I would say some of the bugs did not hit as hard um, as um, they were hitting other operating systems. So for example, in Foreshadow, we were quite um, safe. Um, so especially our customers not using uh, the hardware virtualization extensions, they were safe uh, in the first place. Um, and also uh, for Meltdown, we had to do something, but it was not as bad as for other operating systems. Um, part of the reason is that missing features helped us uh, in a way that we haven't had them, so we don't need to implement uh, countermeasures, um, like for SGX, um, for example. Um, yeah, we saw a dramatic uh, performance impact, um, so especially for this uh, branch prediction barriers, uh, we should consider alternatives compared to the uh, implemented, uh, implemented measures via microcode. Um, while doing that, uh, we had to reconsider some of the legacy implementations within Fiasco, so it helped us yeah, clean up some of the code, and we could see it in the micro benchmarks that we were also able to gain some minor performance improvements in the micro benchmarks. So for example, IO page fault support uh, just uh, we ditched that and uh, moved that over to just general exception handling, um, which is fine. Um, we still have to think about what we expect from the future. Um, we, were, we are constantly asked, uh, also by our customers, um, how we can proactively protect against such vulnerabilities because, um, yeah, there will be more because now this is a new field of actually use the FPUs. And uh, the related question is what kind of optimization level the compiler uses um, because higher optimization levels usually uh, try to employ uh, more um, at least FPU registers.